from beginning to end, I think we pulled this out of the bag in under a year. We used so many lenses. So from tiny little DJI action camera GoPros right up to 1,000 mil lenses. We've used everything in between. We filmed on two continents, Africa and Asia. We filmed a lot of elephants. <laughs> we had multiple crews because we had to shoot in such a short space of time. We had crews working on the four programs all the time concurrently. There must have always been over a dozen people in the field at any one time. They're so like us. What was the biggest challenge in filming elephants? When we first thought about elephants, it's, okay, elephants are big, gray, wrinkled, how were we going to tell four different stories? So we broke it down into our four places, to Asian elephants, to forest, to savanna and desert. So if you take Asia, for instance, that's a real human story. It's about the uh, elephants and humans. And so the lens that I really wanted to go for was like a 24 mil, which is how we see the world. Compare that to forests. And to even see an elephant in the forest is such a rare thing. And it's all, it's a little bit dark and you're always looking. So it's more sort of 50, 85 mil lens like this and always sort of emerging from behind a bush or a branch or a tree just to spot the elephant. Okay, savannah, we know savannah elephants. We feel really at home with them. They're the ones we kind of like, oh yeah, there's an elephant wandering across the plains. So we know it. So it's kind of going to look like this and it's going to be big depth of field. The colors will be rich, multi-led sound. Like, okay. That, that's what it says. So desert's the one that I made. It's vast. So it's either like this or you're so zoomed in and it's the toenail of an elephant walking through the sand or it's silence or the tiny scurrying of a little feet of a beetle over the sand and it's bleached out. And that's how we sort of started with thinking about each of the programs and how they would feel. And we had a short period of time to shoot this in. So there was so much amazing work done by all the researchers, talking to scientists in the field, people who devote their lives to preserving elephants on the ground. And, and we got our stories. The biggest in decades. The super mom knows from experience that this riverbed is no place to be right now. What kind of challenges were presented specifically with filming something in all of that sand in the desert? It's my favorite place on earth, deserts. Everything gets stripped away and you're just left with this vast emptiness. And in the desert, you've got to survive. And often with wildlife filmmaking, you don't think about that. And so you may be struggling literally to survive in a situation, but you've still got to produce beautiful shots. And yeah, we had sandstorms. We had these huge pouring sands pouring in. Yes, it gets everywhere. And yes, at the end of the night in your little tent, you're sat with a paintbrush trying to clean every last grain of sand out of things. And we had ridiculous temperatures up to about 50. And it was so stupidly hot. And then at night, you were dropped almost freezing. And then you couldn't find the elephants. You'd go in the morning, you're like, where are the elephants? And they would often walk 50 miles a day. So you're then driving and you don't really have a safety backup. You've, you've just got to get yourselves out of the problem. But everywhere we went, you rely on the knowledge of the local people. So Paul, Hendricks, they got us to where they thought this water would come. Once a year, the water, the rains come into the east and it sometimes trickles down through. So we waited and waited and this water finally came down this dry riverbed where exactly the right place. And then this bull elephant just walks out. And he just waits for the water with us. We're just, and it was so beautiful, this once a year event. And he walks, as the water comes, he comes and has a drink. It was so beautiful. But then the water kept coming and it kept coming and it became this flood. And we had to start driving away real quick. I was like, we got to go. And so we're driving. I'm trying to do these beautiful serene drone shots, but I'm in the car like this. I, like, Paul, you've got to drive more calmly. Just slow down. He's like, we can't. There's a this wall of water following us. And then the elephants were trying to escape the flood as well. So it was going to be this life-giving event, but it became this sort of everyone's fleeing. And so you're having to dive off the bank, try and grab some long shots on the camera, jump back in, try and do drone. Ah, we've got to go, go, go. And it was a case of survival. The elephants were trying to survive to get out of the riverbed. We were trying to get out. And amongst all of that, you're trying to film. But it's beautiful. It's, it's so serene and so magical. 
the water that moments ago was life-threatening has now become life-sustaining. James Cameron is a producer on this. So what were the benefits of having him as a producer? And why do you think that he wanted to be a part of this? I think after whales, elephants are kind of a natural progression. Not progression, that implies that elephants are better than whales. They are a little bit, but they're not. Um, for us having James there, it just really inspired us. Like, you may be feeling tired, you may be feeling knackered, you may think that'll do, and then you go, ooh, James Cameron's going to be looking at this. We need to <laughs> really work a little bit harder just to know that the eyes at the end of the line watching it are such an idol as him. They were here long before us. And if they go, that entire wisdom will be lost. Is it hard to maintain a sense of hope when you're working on a project like this amid a climate disaster and when you're seeing, you know, how devastating some of the effects can be on these creatures? I find it really hard to be positive. I really struggle. The desert elephants, there's only 120 left. And by sort of human encroachment around, we've cut them off from the Tosh National Park. So we we kind of need to create this corridor to save them. And I lose, I do lose hope often, but then everywhere I go, there are extraordinary people, people who live there, devoting their lives to these animals, to their environment. And when you spend time around people who are literally putting their lives on the line for the wildlife of this planet, it's kind of like, okay, I need to keep fighting. If they are risking their very lives, we need to do our bit as well. And we can underplay the importance of films. We can go, it's a pretty film about elephants. It's not. It's a really important film because if it can impassion children, young people to go, elephants are important and learn about elephants a bit, then we care about them. Then money can go to preserving them and relationships. You know, there's wonderful stories about educating people through Asia and in Africa about the truth about elephants. And so human elephant relationships can be can be improved. And in that way, we can live in harmony. We've proved over and over that animals, elephants, people can all live in harmony if we follow some of these amazing examples that, that we were able to capture. So yes, I lose hope, but then I meet extraordinary people and I get a little bit more. It's not just noise. It has meaning. Was there a special elephant that you bonded with that you had a soft spot for when you were filming? I filmed elephants for 25 years. And a dear friend once said, elephants have all the best traits of humans and none of the bad ones. If you can spend time with elephants and learn from them, we become better people. So not on this series before I've spent many years in East Africa working with orphan elephants. And, and I knew an elephant called Emily who would always come and we'd spend, we became real good buddies and we'd chat over many years. And I remember her bringing her little baby to introduce her wild baby to me. And that I just sobbed, just sobbed tears. In this series, we followed this bull who we had rumors that way up north when no one goes, there was this dry riverbed and someone had spotted an elephant. Like no elephant had been there for years. And we took a risk. We drove two, three days up. And there was this sort of bull. He, would, he was sort of 25-ish, but he was too young to mate. And there were only a few desert elephants. He was really lonely. And he was wandering down this riverbed and for days and days. And, and it kind of really touched my heart. The loneliness of, of these desert elephants, of, of the males, was, was quite profound. And I was really touched by him and his story. And and he didn't, we didn't let him come up to us because that's not fair on him and, and you just keep your distance. But, you know, you could see that he would be close-ish and just for some company. So yeah, I remember really resonating with him. And then when the baby was born and I remember when we came back and it was a few months old and so full of life and it was so precious that there had been no baby born that had survived for eight years. And to see this little one walking along with with mum and grand and aunts, these ladies. That was very special just to see this little one and just giving blessings, this, you know, that was special. 